I V M. Hey everybody, quick request once again if you could help us out by filling out our survey. It's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. This really helps us talk to advertisers about the kinds of people listening to these shows. Really do appreciate your help and we're going to be doing a random drawing and we'll be sending out some IVM swag. Hope you enjoy that. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. As Joe Biden prepares to take over as the next president of the United States, there's a lot of speculation about what it might mean for the triangle between Washington Brussels and Beijing how does the european union see the coming of joe biden and what does it mean for relations between the european union and china to discuss all this i have with me manoj a welcome manoj hey you know you've written a uh, very interesting column about just the subject recently and we'll put a link to that in the description uh, i want you to first tell us if you can Uh, just give us an update of what's been happening in EU China relations of late because it seems quite interesting there's the on the one hand a magnitsky act uh, for human rights abuses and at the same time both sides are rushing towards a trade deal yeah this is this uh, interesting dynamic that's been playing out between uh, europe and china uh, i mean for the last couple of years but uh, in the last year through all this uh, through the pandemic and through the deepening bitterness between the trump administration in beijing uh, you see in the european union sort of uh, in some ways uh, assess its priorities uh, differently from how the us has done and i think it's been doing that for the last few years there is a certain there are certain phrases uh, within the eu lexicon that have become uh, important when it comes to so when you examine this triangle between washington brussels and beijing one of those phrases is strategic autonomy which uh, we in india are very uh, familiar with and the other phrase was uh, this idea of westlessness the idea that the concept and the notion of the west seems to be eroding um, sort of the geopolitical west that concept seems to be eroding um, and that was linked to trump's sort of approach to his uh, allies Uh, but now that trump's going away and biden's talking about working with traditional allies and partners again and you know rejoining multilateralism and all of that yes the eu is excited about that and you can see that in their initial reactions to biden's win in november even, and even today but uh, there's also this sort of thought that you know policies of trump were not just about trump they were also about a certain social anxiety and movement within the us which prevails which continues to exist right uh, i mean trump did win more votes uh, than any other president uh, losing the election so you you do know that you know there's going to be that anxiety that exists um, so that's the other thing that you know will this sense of uh, america first go away eventually biden may last for four years how that would shape policy you don't know but essentially you get this sense that you know you need to be in some ways much more autonomous and the third sort of concept underlying all of this uh, is this idea of uh, whether europe needs to have its own sort of space uh, its own sort of policy making space its own sort of sense of uh, autonomy with regard to china policy so uh, if you look at these three ideas that are there that's when you start to come to a point where you understand start to think of how the europeans are approaching their relationships uh, with beijing in the last couple of weeks we've seen uh, a couple of interesting developments we've seen like you said uh, the european uh, commission passing the european magnitsky act that is essentially modeled on the us magnitsky act uh, the global magnitsky act in the us essentially it gives teeth to all your uh, statements with regard to human rights violations where you can impose certain kinds of sanctions uh, on assets and on travel uh, of people who you believe are involved in uh, violating human rights now think of this in the context of european criticism repeatedly of china uh, through the year with regard to hong kong and with regard to xinjiang different constituencies in europe have been critical in different ways uh, for example the german foreign minister uh, in august september this year essentially told the chinese we want you to revoke this national security act in hong kong and go back to status quo um obviously the chinese are not going to do that 
at that point of time in September, you had a European uh, summit with the Chinese, with uh, Angela Merkel and European other European leaders attending the meeting, European EU leaders attending the meeting, and Xi Jinping told them in no uncertain words that, you know, on human rights, we don't need, and I quote, an instructor. These are tensions between China and EU, which are independent of, uh, you know, Washington. On the other hand, there is also this long negotiated investment agreement that's, that they're talking about. Uh, it's been seven years in talks. Essentially, it's promising far more market access to European companies, some degree of harmonizing labor laws. Uh, the details of the agreement are obviously not public, but that's the idea that you get greater access to European companies get greater access to the Chinese market and European products get greater access to the Chinese market and they get treated much more equitably when it comes to uh, working in the Chinese market uh, in the context of how Chinese firms get treated. Um, and that's the kind of commitment that EU has been asking for a very long time. There have been 35 rounds of negotiations for this agreement. And increasingly, we're hearing that, uh, you know, by the end of this year, which is where they both said it committed that they want to conclude this agreement. And there's not a long time to go for the year to end, um, that they will come out with some sort of an agreement. And just in fact, today, there was this piece in uh, the South China Morning Post, which talks about how, uh, you know, Angela Merkel and uh, Emmanuel Macron, are they're understood to be in agreement uh, with regard to the deal. And they're sort of, in principle, the deal seems to have been agreed upon. The details are still awaited, but uh, the idea is that the EU seems to be balancing its economic interests vis-a-vis its political interests, but then also its geopolitical interests. Because while it's doing all of this, it's also echoing, you know, the EU foreign policy chief is echoing Trump's, uh, sorry, Biden's call of uh, working with partners by saying immediately after Biden declared victory, Joseph Borrell, who is the EU's foreign policy chief, came out with a statement saying that... Uh, you know, we're excited to work with uh, this new administration to form a coherent China policy. And Biden sort of said very similar things, saying that we need leverage on China policy and that leverage will come when we work with our allies. Now, what will be the nature of that conversation is something that we need to look at. One sort of speculation is, and this is again in this realm of speculation, um, in late November, the Financial Times had reported that the EU is likely to propose some sort of a transatlantic technology council, you know, trade and technology council, which would sort of jointly set standards on new technologies, uh, so, you know, work to strengthen technological industrial leadership of the allies across the Atlantic uh, and expand trade and investment. So you set the rules and you create your own basis of innovation basis on which you can compete with the Chinese. None of that has officially come to pass. Nobody's officially sort of accepted that these things exist, uh, that this conversation has happened. Um, But this is based on a draft EU position paper, uh, which the Financial Times reported about. But we are still to see whether all of these things are going to happen. But you can just see how the EU is trying to balance all of this. Yeah, so Manoj, that's really interesting because it would seem to me that the EU really has... uh these contradictory impulses or at least contrasting impulses pulling in different directions. On the one hand, China does not pose an immediate direct threat to it the way that, for instance, the Soviet Union once did. Though obviously there are problems. Uh, Similarly, the EU is interested in the idea of its own autonomy from Washington. It's seen what happened during the Trump administration and, you know, its confidence in the U.S. is is, is not restored. You know, everybody understands that the U.S. Is, is likely to be looking inwards, at least for the next few years, more absorbed in its own problems. And on the other hand, you have China, which would like to maintain as much distance between the U.S. and EU as possible, right? It would not like the development of that so-called coherent strategy, or, you know, the uh, building of a like-minded coalition of democracies and so on. How do both the EU and China navigate this dynamic? That's what's playing out interestingly. And again, this is, we're in a period of transition in Washington. So once Biden takes charge, we'll have to see how things happen. Um, he's specifically said that, you know, uh, I'm not going to be doing, in that interview that he gave to Tom Friedman, he specifically said that I'm not going to be doing anything. I'm not making any sudden moves. I'm going to first review everything and then take a call of things. So they're also, so Beijing and Brussels are also likely waiting and watching in some ways. But in the meantime, they're also acting. Uh, Beijing is acting uh, by uh, trying to sort of sweeten the pot in some ways uh, with Brussels. And at the same time, sort of emphasizing these uh, essential differences uh, that it sees that exist between the EU and the US. Um, Autonomy obviously being one of them primarily. For instance, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, or let's even go back to sort of 
you know, let me, let me take you back to August and September. This is when Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, was traveling to Europe, which was for what he, what was sort of, you know, pipped as a charm offensive. It was anything but that he ended up in a position where he actually worsened the situation politically. He traveled to five countries uh, where in Norway he got into this scuffle over, you know, a question over uh, whether uh, you could end up seeing, uh, you know, the activists in Hong Kong being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Then he lands in France and there he has this year full with Macron about, uh, again, the situation in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. And then he finally comes to Berlin, where in his press conference with his German counterpart, he obviously gets asked questions about Hong Kong and Xinjiang. He defends the Chinese position on that. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, he makes this comment about uh, the president of uh, the Senate of the Czech Republic, where he essentially threatens uh, him with, you know, uh, consequences uh, because of his visit to Taiwan. The idea that the Czech Senate president had led a delegation to visit Taiwan uh, and Wang Yi sort of lashes out at him, threatening him with consequences. And the German and his German counterpart responds to that in a public forum at the same time, uh, saying something like, look, we are Europeans, we stand together, we work together and we don't respond well to threats. And that's as bad as a press conference you can have, particularly for something that you call a charm offensive. Now, if you go back even some more months before that, you know, when the pandemic sort of begins uh, and China sort of launches its silk, health silk road and, you know, all these health supplies and everything, those also sort of uh, stir up a lot of European anxiety because all of this leads to uh, what's come to be known as mass diplomacy, where, you know, all these supplies that were coming from China, they were, you know, they came with lots of fanfare. Uh, when the flights landed, you had, you know, the live coverage by Chinese media. Uh, you had this constant reportage back home about how, uh, you know, everybody in these parts of the world are so thankful to us because we are doing these wonderful things for them and we are supplying all of this to them. I remember very distinctly that there's, a, there's an opinion piece written by the Chinese ambassador to the EU, Chiang Ming. He writes that in People's Daily where he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, where he talks about how people, friends in Europe are so happy with the, all the wonderful work that we have done uh, and yet they don't understand how we have been able to control the virus. And when they ask me, you know, my friends in Europe ask me, how have you managed to do this? And I tell them there is only one sort of magic, whatever bullet, which is the com this, the organizational strength and whatever the Communist Party of China, which is Jinping at its core. So this the usage of your you know, health supply sales predominantly. Firstly, highlighting them as donations uh, and not necessarily as sales. Secondly, uh, highlighting them as this humanitarian gesture. Thirdly, using that for domestic narrative, which creates friction internationally. It's just, it's strange that, you know, that is not understood as well, that the domestic and the global is very deeply linked. So you can't be selling one story at home and expect the world not to listen to it also and get irritated by it. Um, and lastly, then this idea that, you know, the European Union got deeply questioned at that point of time. You know, countries like Italy felt uh, slighted, country, Italy particularly felt that, you know, the EU had not stepped up in time. And the EU subsequently in April apologized to Italy for not having done its uh, sufficient to help Italy in its time of need, because Italy was one of the first countries in Europe where COVID was serious. Um, and at that point in time, there was lots of writing about in Chinese media also about how China is the only country that's helped Italy. Uh, likewise, if you remember in March, there was the Serbian president. Uh, and this was after the EU had commissioned specific support systems uh, on COVID. Uh, you know, a couple of days after that, uh, Serbia, which is not a member of the EU, was also listed in the list of countries which would get supported. Uh, yet the Serbian president went on about, you know, how European solidarity is like a fairy tale. It doesn't exist. Uh, and China is the only country that can help us. And I'm only looking at Xi Jinping. And, you know, a day or so after that big public comment, you have the Chinese uh, ambassador to Serbia coming on air and saying, yes, we will support you. And we've just cleared this emergency batch. And then that emergency batch lands uh, and you have these pictures splashed on television constantly with the Serbian president standing as the flight lands and the supplies are coming out and he's kissing the Chinese flag. And all that gets played up in the Chinese media. Now, this gets obviously visibility in Europe also. And where they start to feel that, okay, so the threat from China that we anticipate with regard to European unity, 
may not be territorial like it was in the case of Soviet Union, but it can be far more uh, subtle uh, and far more insidious where it undermines EU unity. And this has been a long-standing worry for the Europeans, uh, you know, particularly with regard to how Chinese investments can change behavior of uh, members of the EU. Uh, and since a lot of the EU decision-making has to happen on unanimity, that can undermine and paralyze the union. So those, if you look at that entire thread, and I've taken you back in different directions, but if you take that thread from this year, just from March, uh, April to September to then today, what you see is that, uh, you know, the EU is cautiously trying to create space for itself. I think Biden's victory gave it some more space because now it has that leverage where it can actually, you know, uh, work with Biden on certain issues, but also use that leverage in Beijing. And from Beijing's point of view, it's basically argued that, look, you have essential differences with the US and those have come to the fore under Trump. Those are not going to go anywhere. The other aspect is that, you know, any anticipation that the EU and the US are going to work together seamlessly on this, well, that's not necessarily going to happen. You know, you have Chinese analysts writing that, look, oh, the EU has a long problem list with the US uh, and that includes trade, technology, everything. I mean, if you remember the trade war in some ways under Trump started with Trump importing, imposing tariffs on, you know, steel tariffs on allies and partners. And then the EU sort of gave, gave back with tariffs and that sort of tit for tat has continued. So there's this whole set of things that you have to unravel uh, between the transatlantic allies. Um, and it might be easy under Biden. It might be much more possible under Biden, but how sustainable that is. And that's what the Chinese have been sort of highlighting to make sure that there is this wedge, along with obviously highlighting that, look, we don't pose an existential threat to you. We have no territorial designs over there, unlike what it was in the case of Soviet Union. So why would you even think of Cold War paradigms? Yeah, I think uh, the Europeans would buy the argument that there is no direct territorial threat to them. Uh, do they, on the other hand, get a sense that maybe uh, China might undermine democracy in the periphery of the European Union? I'm thinking you mentioned Serbia, but also Hungary. Uh, you know, there's this much talked about Budapest, Belgrade Railroad uh, and so on. So is there a sense that maybe at the fringes of the European Union, among the newer members, uh, where democracy is still an uncertain project, uh, there might be a challenge from China? Yeah, I think that's that's the, that's the one of the other concerns, right? That how does it shape, particularly say what you've seen in Hungary, um, how does it shape uh, discourse within these countries, not just through investments, but also through media partnerships, uh, also through management of conversations with regard to the effectiveness of systems, right? The idea that uh, this entire business of mass diplomacy that I talked about, I mean, as much as it propped up Beijing, and that's what Beijing was largely trying to do. What it also does is that it creates this sense that there is a system which works better, far more efficiently and, you know, achieves objectives uh, better than, you know, these, uh, the European bureaucracy. And that uh, poses a fundamental challenge from at a country level to begin with, where, you know, the idea that authoritarian, authoritarianism is seen much more favorably, uh, Chinese investments, uh, because the way they function, uh, support that sort of behavior. And then you've got uh, this discourse of, you know, how the Chinese system has worked far more efficient because of this sort of unitary form of government. And that then creates impulses in terms of favor, you know, in favor of authoritarianism, which undermines certain basic values. And we've seen that through the pandemic in parts of Eastern Europe. So I think that's another very big concern for them. Again, but from a European point of view, uh, if you're thinking from the point of view of, you know, and again, when we talk about European point of view, we need to realize that the EU is 27 member countries. It's, uh, you know, uh, there are different points of view. It's very difficult to come up with a European point of view. And that's reflected also in the debate over 5G, where they've tried very hard to sort of harmonize things, yet each country has somewhat different approaches to things. To be able to balance that yet to keep, keep unity and then the challenge that China poses from a value perspective and a financial perspective to that unity is where the European threat perception with Beijing exists. Um, is that serious enough? Is that an existential threat perception for uh, these countries to give up, uh, you know, uh, to combine together as a whole under the EU to give up the economic opportunities that Beijing might bring uh, and in some ways partner with the US. And would the US want that sort of partnership? That's the other sort of dynamic. And I think, therefore, what they're trying to do, what the Europeans are trying to do largely is sort of balance between these interests, create their own sort of space, which I don't think has been 
I mean, a couple of years till I sort of year or so ago, that argument would have sort of flown very, fairly well in India also. And I guess in some quarters in India, even today, it sort of works, you know, that argument. Yet the sort of the fact that there is a territorial threat posed uh, by China to India undermines uh, that argument. Um, and but I would assume that you know if you were to come to sort of some sort of an agreement on the territorial threat, India would do something very similar, where it would try to sort of create its own space service or interest. And I think if you think of it in that context, that's what Europe's trying to do without the territorial threat and this other threat of undermining values, undermining governance systems, undermining European unity exists, but irrespective of that, from a European point of view, if you think of it, is the prospect of being in the EU still significantly rewarding for some of these countries in, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe? Yes, it is still rewarding because there is much to still gain. And there's a game over there that the Europeans can also play, which, like I said, during the pandemic, they attempted to eventually, they got their act together subsequently, where they did offer support to even countries which were prospective member states and not just member states. So they're also doing things to try and advance their own interests. But yeah, the challenge from China from that point of view is uh, like you described. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, Now, the other aspect of this is, of course, trade, which you uh, touched upon. Uh, What is the nature of the trade relationship between between EU and uh, China? Uh, Once again, I get the sense that this is also lopsided in the sense that it's mostly China selling to the EU. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it is lopsided, but it's very, very significant. Okay, so the European Union has been one of the biggest trade partners for the Chinese. And it's understandable. It's such a large area and a prosperous large area. Uh, and it's been one of China's biggest trading partners for the longest time. Um, this year, you've got ASEAN, which, uh, you know, took the cake when it came to trade with China. Uh, and that's because of the trade restrictions with regard to COVID. But even then, what we saw this year was that uh, China became the EU's largest trade partner for the first time this year. And that is data available to the first half of the year. So subsequently, we'll have to see. Uh, but at least in the first half of the year, you saw the Chinese, uh, you know, going past the US to become the EU's largest trade partner. Um, the trade is lopsided, like you said, uh, from what Eurostat informs us, uh, you know, uh, you've got... Uh, about 30, 328 uh, billion euros worth of trade between the, the two areas. China accounts for the EU's largest source of imports, uh, about 22% of European imports, and uh, just about 10.3% of European exports. So yes, it is extremely lopsided. But again, when we think of these lopsided tra- uh, trade uh, relationships, we end up in this, you know, in some ways, it's very Trumpian idea of, you know, oh, we're being taken for a ride. But I mean, if you look at European assessments themselves, they will tell you that, yes, it may be lopsided, but what it also does is that it, these cheap imports, uh, uh, you know, free up uh, a greater disposable income for European citizens, which then also feeds consumption and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not necessarily a negative deal in that sense. Would you want greater parity? Would you want to be selling much more? Yes, you would want to. And in that sense, the Be- Beijing sort of highlights the fact that you they uh, agreed this year in September with uh, the European Union uh, on a deal which allows greater ac- market access for European agricultural goods. Um, and that will sort of start to change some of this trade dynamic. And there's another aspect of this trade, okay? Uh, you know, there was a recent study which was done by the Mercator Institute uh, for China Studies, which is a European think tank. And they uh, essentially looked at the trade relationship and they said, let's talk about what are our vulnerabilities, what are our dependencies. And their argument was this, that, you know, they found 103 product categories across electronics, minerals, pharmaceuticals, medical drugs, uh, rare earths, and so on and so forth, uh, in which the EU has, what they said, a critical strategic dependence on imports from China. This is important because then you start to identify areas in which you want to diversify so that you can reduce some of your dependence. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is from a, uh, from a trade point of view, if you look at uh, investment, the Merrick study also found that, uh, you know, on an average, and they studied about 25, you know, European companies across member states, across industries uh, working in China. And they found that around 11% of the profits of these European companies came from uh, the Chinese market. That's not a huge amount, uh, but it's fairly fairly significant amount. Uh, uh, and if you can see that uh, a lot of these European companies are in China for the Chinese market. And if you have a deal which expands, which creates a fairer playing field for them, which expands market access for them, their profit therefore might sort of go up also. So there's greater incentive to stay there. Again, there's been lots of talk this year about how, you know, 
there'll be decoupling and supply chains will shift and a lot of that. And I think some of that is happening. But if you look at repeated surveys that have come out uh, from different chambers of commerce, uh, you see that very little is actually changing. There was a recent survey of British businesses and around 3% of businesses in China were thinking about moving out, uh, you know, British businesses. From an EU point of view, the EU Chamber of Commerce's survey uh, uh, in China uh, said that around 11% of companies, again, say that they are thinking about shifting current or planned investments to other markets. So it's not like a lot of people are planning to leave anytime soon. Uh, but there is a greater consciousness about sort of geopolitical threats impinging on companies uh, and eventually on trade. So that's the sort of nature of the trading relationship. Uh, and one would assume that this investment treaty and the rest of it might sort of change that economic relationship a little bit more. I mean, the merit study, I recommend everybody to go and just check it out because uh, it tells you that there are specific sectors in which you can... Uh, you need to diversify, but also there isn't necessarily a strategic vulnerability because interdependence plays two ways. Uh, and therefore, to think of this dependence as uh, fundamentally problematic is incorrect. Uh, and I think that's something that's important to keep in mind, even when we look at the debate in India about our dependency on China. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, while decoupling might take place in some sectors, high tech and so on, the idea that it's going to take place all across the board is is kind of far-fetched, not just in in geographies like the EU, but also with India. But, you know, speaking about high tech, Manoj, uh, what are the prospects for a collaboration on high technology among like-minded countries, perhaps democracies? Uh, this has been talked about quite a bit, uh, including in India. We are, we've also been looking into the subject. How do the Europeans see this? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at what, uh, you know, what we've been reading about, uh, you know, from reportage about, you know, this new sort of thinking in the European Union about how you need to uh, come up with this trade and technology council with the U.S. I, I, I mean, I think it all sounds interesting on paper, but uh, I, I'm a little skeptical about how you would go about uh, putting this together. Uh, I mean, I don't know enough in terms of how you would go about putting this together because there's not enough in the public domain right now. What we do in the meantime see, uh, and I would want to sort of, uh, you know, take the time to quote uh, the EU foreign policy uh, chief, Jose Porel, on this, where he talks about, you know, uh, the need for having autonomy. You know, when he was asked recently, this is what he said, right? If you want to live under the protective umbrella of the United States from the military point of view, it's certainly cheaper. But it, but it is also certain that you are dependent. And this is true in terms of technological development, because we are certainly not doing enough to maintain our own capacity and, of, for action. That's what autonomy means. Now, that's telling, that's giving you a very different signal to, you know, what you're reading about uh, in reports about, you know, a trade and technology council. I think there are certain questions that need to be answered before you can start to look at what this would mean. Firstly, Europe will have its own regulatory mechanisms. Can it harmonize those regulatory mechanisms with the US and then with other democracies? So if you're going to look at India as a partner to this in terms of like-minded democracies, you would have to have domestic regulation in some ways harmonized with regulation in these other countries. And that's not going to be an easy process, particularly when on a lot of these technological issues, domestic regulation is playing catch up in most countries to technological advancement. For example, on data, Europe's had GDPR for a very long time. We've still not been able to come up with our own, our own data protection legislation, or at least it's not gone through parliament as yet. Um, we've still got sort of some loose frameworks, and but largely it's a space that's ungoverned. Um, so that's one challenge that you need to look at harmonizing domestic regulations across the board. The next challenge is who gains from these developments? You've got private companies playing. There's a very different approach to regulating these big technology companies in Europe vis-a-vis -vis in the US. What's the future of these companies? Where do they pay taxes? How do they pay taxes? That's the other sort of issue that you need to regulate. And in that, these corporations are going to be key actors. Uh, and what role will they play to be able to shape this? So that's the sort of second part of when we talk about creating this grand technology alliance. The third part is that conventionally, when we've spoken about setting standards, you know, essentially, if you go back to sort of the history of technological standard setting, whether it's telecoms or whatever, uh, what you saw that, you know, you had a German company, you had an American company, they set their own standard, these guys set their own standard. And then your global standard setting was to create some harmony so that you can have interoperability. 
Today, that's not necessarily the case when it comes to, say, newer domains, right? Because we are setting standards which are inherently going to be global, uh, which is what sort of Huawei and the rest of it are trying to do. In that, can you see corporations and governments aligning together across the Atlantic to be able to do that? And what will be the cost of some of that uh, for other countries, say, within the European Union, you know, uh, particularly when you might have cheaper alternatives, which is equally good setting standards. So that contest has changed quite significantly. So how will those sorts of, you know, issues be harmonized is another thing. And I mean, I I haven't read through this yet, but, you know, the the European Union just uh, recently, very recently, I mean, three days ago, passed the Digital Services Act uh, and the Digital Markets Act. And that's been passed before Biden comes to office. So they are setting in place their own sort of uh, digital rules, which then the Biden administration will have to work with to try and harmonize. So it's not like you're waiting for you know, them to come into power and then you're going to talk about these things. So I think it's not going to be as easy as some of us have made it out to be that, you know, there will be... Uh, that there will be straightforward congruence of interests. I think these interests are very, very uh, scattered and it's not necessarily going to be uh, as easy. Uh, And I think that's the space that we need to watch out for when we talk about these alliances and the rest of it. Absolutely. Thank you for injecting that much needed dose of reality into this Tahiti talk about uh, a tech collaboration or tech alliance even. Um, Thanks, Manoj. Uh, This has really been an interesting conversation because the EU is not an area where we tend to pay a lot of attention. uh, And yet, uh, the way that the EU's relationship with both China and the US progress will have uh, serious implications for India. Uh, So I hope to have uh, more such episodes with you in the future and to learn more from you on this subject. Uh, Until then, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks so much. Please consider signing up for Takshashila's courses. Applications are now open and you can apply at www.takshashila.org.in slash courses. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media, The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Once again, just a quick reminder, please do help us out by filling out our survey. It's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It really does help us figure out who's listening and, you know, what are the characteristics that we can go and push to advertisers. That is massively helpful to us. Please, please, please do help out with that. So, on the network this week, let me start with a quick milestone. It's the 100th episode of Begin the Journey with Ashish Vidyarthi. Congratulations to Ashish and the team. Great show. If you're not listening to it, he talks to you about just how to approach life. It's just very, very cool stuff. Do check this out. Want to mention the note with Maru Kinaya. She talks about why petrol prices are so high. On the Wired talk, Siddharth speaks with Harsh Mandar. On Advertising is Dead, Varun speaks to Kabir Biswas, the founder of Dunzo. They have a really interesting conversation about, you know, what's the future of Dunzo and what they're thinking about. On the Traveling Professor's Diaries, check out Siddharth talk about the performance paradox. I found it really fascinating and interesting. I think that you guys will really get something out of listening to that. Please do give that a listen. And finally, let me mention Zindagi Diaries. It's Ragini Kumar's poetry podcast. The first week when it came out, we put out five poems first week. We put out another five poems this week. And the response has been phenomenal. Do check it out. It's in Hindi. It's a poetry podcast. Something a little different. Do give it a shot and let us know what you think. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun, and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IVM app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.